All right. Hello. Welcome. Uh, I have Dr. Daphne Evans here today. She is one of my dearest friends and also probably the smartest person I know. And I'm Jill Wiener, by the way. Um, I'm a formerly practicing physician, meditation and tapping teacher. And I also have a very strong interest in social justice and anti-racism. And I've been doing this set of, set of interviews to help people take a, a deeper look, a more nuanced look into um, how COVID has been affecting these problems that have already been there, but, but what's been happening during COVID to amplify and ma uh, magnify these problems. So Dabney, thank you so much for joining me. It's so much fun to interview you. I don't think we've ever worked together professionally. So um, if you could please uh, tell my lovely audience a little bit about yourself and who you are and your interest in, um, I guess today I didn't even mention our topic. We're going to be talking about violence uh, in the home, violence against women, and also uh, time permitting, we'll talk about um, abortion access and, and reproductive justice, uh, which has been made a lot more difficult in, in the states that you would expect um, because of using COVID as an excuse. So um, Dabney, please share with us who you are and what you do. Thanks so much. I'm really excited to be with you, Jill. I'm also a fan of your work, so um, appreciate you having me on. So my name is Dabney Evans. I'm an associate professor within the Hubert Department of Global Health in the Rollins School of Public Health at Emory University here in Atlanta. You see our lovely campus in the background, although I am not actually there. Today is actually a rainy day in Atlanta, so don't be fooled. Um, my work is focused mainly on health and human rights. And within that, I focus specifically on women's health. And I focus on a couple of topics, mainly topics that are pretty stigmatized, but actually very common. So one of those topics is gender-based violence. Um, specifically, I look at violence against women and girls. And that's a topic that we can look at really over the life course. So if we look at girls and women, we can see that basically from birth to death, um, women uh, and people that identify as women are affected differently by a wide range of health topics. And that includes violence throughout the life course. So we can think about um, child maltreatment and child abuse, childhood sexual abuse. Um, we can think about child malnutrition. Um, in other settings, we can also think about teen dating violence. We can think about sexual violence that happens. We can think about intimate partner violence, female genital cutting or mutilation, which takes place in some settings. Intimate partner violence, which of course can take place throughout, um, throughout intimate relationships over the life course, as well as elder abuse. So women and people that identify as women are affected differently, more frequently, and typically more severely by this kind of violence. So that's something that I focus on a lot in my work. And then the other uh, stigmatized topic that I talk about a lot is sort of under the umbrella of sexual and reproductive health and rights. And so specifically within that topic, I talk about abortion and abortion access um, here in Georgia as well as elsewhere. Awesome. All right. Well, and, and Dabney's always my go-to for like, what do you think about this policy? And what do you think about this politician? And who are you voting for for this? Because you've always thought it all through, you've read everything. And I, I feel like I just trust your opinions um, so inherently, um, even though we, we've been friends since well before I really cared about issues such as that uh, when you were starting out in your public health career. So um, awesome. So could you talk to me a little bit? The, the reason I, I invited you um, to, to, to be part of this uh, interview series is because, you know, a lot of people were, were having this, oh, I'm sheltering in place. Um, it's so hard being home with my family. My husband's driving me crazy. My wife's driving me crazy. My kids are driving me crazy. That is all real and that is all legit. But for a lot of people, it goes well beyond that. And I'm, I'm wanting to shed some light on, on um, what's happening for, for people who are now, now being at home is they're literally trapped and they're literally in a violent situation. Could you talk a little bit about what that's like for women who are who are being abused um, or children who are being abused um, if substance how substance abuse plays into that um, and and how covid has made that worse yeah absolutely so i'm really glad that this has received some attention it's actually received quite a bit of attention in um, public media sources at least the ones that i follow mm -hmm. and um, so i want to say a couple of things about this the first thing is that we really don't actually know um, there's a lot of speculation that things like shelter in place, quarantine and isolation, that these kind of movement restrictions have negative impacts, particularly on people that are in relationships that are already violent. 
Um, and it makes a lot of sense, right? That's a logical conclusion to come to. But I want to say that all of the evidence that we have around this, particularly from other countries that were already experiencing COVID before it came to the States, um, are really anecdotal or observational data. So in China, um, in one city, there were reports that intimate partner violence went up by about 50%. In other places, particularly in France, there was an increase of about 36%. But again, these are not systematically collected data that like the kind that we would typically gather when we would do a population-based study um, from a public health perspective. So I think it's important that we pay attention to this and that we really do think about what these, um, what these restrictions on movements potentially do. And so there are really two things that I would draw attention to. The first thing that I would draw attention to is that we already know that violence is a pandemic in this country and really globally before COVID. So we know that globally, one in three women will experience physical, sexual, or psychological violence during her lifetime. That's without a pandemic, right? That's without people being told to shelter in place. So what that means is, you know, roughly a third of half of the population um, is experiencing some form of violence. So that's a serious public health problem in and of itself, and that's without COVID. When we add COVID on top of that, the thing that I would say is what's most important is that we pay attention to what immediate needs are. So just because we don't have data that are specific to what's happening as a result of COVID doesn't mean that as a society, we shouldn't be thinking about and planning for programs that address violence because we know that violence was already happening in our society. And that's true not only of intimate partner violence, but also things like child sexual abuse, like human trafficking and other forms of violence as well. So these forms of violence are very prevalent across the world and within American society. And so because we know how prevalent they are before COVID, it automatically means that we should be planning for them during COVID. So for me, what that looks like is that, um, you know, we've had a lot of conversation about funding packages from the federal government and the particular things that states are doing. States are the ones that are deciding about shelter in place orders like here in Georgia. <laughs> um, and we really need to think about funding for survivors of violence during this time period. Um, there are some data coming out of other countries in terms of the kinds of programs that they're providing. So things like providing hotel rooms for survivors, um, providing for police to be able to come out. A lot of people are even afraid to call 911 because they're not sure that the police will come during a period of movement restrictions. So what can we as a society think about in terms of how we ought to be responding given the new circumstances that we're living in in the COVID time period? So that means a couple of things. It means number one, when um, governments, when the federal government or state government is considering funding or funding allocation, that violence needs to be on the agenda. Yeah. We know that this is a problem before COVID, it's going to be a problem during COVID. And we need to think about how can we adapt existing programs and policies to support um, survivors as they're happening. The second thing that needs to happen is we need to think about the COVID time period as a way to gain more information for future public health preparedness, future pandemic or epidemic preparedness. So what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is all of the data that I shared, and I said, these are anecdotal data, these are reports, but they're not systematically collected. So what that says to me as a researcher is we need to be collecting data right now. And we need to be asking people about how are these movement restrictions affecting the violence that you may be experiencing in your life. So are violence rates going up? We don't know. Are, is violence being perpetrated or experienced differently? We don't know. And so those are research questions that myself and others are interested in exploring so that number one, we can inform the response that's happening right now and we can inform policymakers right now about what we need to do to respond to these kinds of events but also for preparedness efforts. So we know that the battle against COVID is gonna be a long one. We're looking at you know, potentially having waves of this for an undetermined period of time. And it's possible that we may need to shelter in place again at some point in the future. So what information can we gather right now so that we can use it for preparedness and response in the future during not only the COVID period, but also other emergency events? 
So what do you, um, how do you get to these women? Like how, how would you do the research while it's happening? What are ways that you as a researcher infiltrate so that they can feel safe answering? Well, I don't want to give away all my research Fair. secrets. Okay. okay. <laughs> In general, like in couple, I'll cover my eyes so that. No, <laughs> but I think, I think that we know that, um, people are going to experience violence. And you know, the most extreme forms of violence are, we're gonna see them showing up in our hospitals with traumatic injury. Mm -hmm. And so that's one place that we can think about as a potential place for intervention. Um, but there are also some promising things that we know from the violence literature, again, even without COVID. So for example, um, people that experience violent relationships, most of the time, they don't actually want the relationship to end, they want the violence to end. And so for a lot of people, this is a deterrent in leaving a relationship. And we want people to have their own autonomy and make their own decisions about what they want to happen with their lives. So one of the things that's been happening within um, the, the academic community dealing with these issues is to think about safety planning. So that is to be able to provide people that are experiencing violence within their relationships with information about the kind of risks that they may face. Mm -hmm. So there are some tools. There's a tool called the danger assessment. That's a tool that's available online um, that people can answer a 20 question survey about violence that they may be experiencing. And it sort of gives people a, um, a check, right, on how normal what it is that they're experiencing um, within their relationship may or may not be and get them thinking about um, what might I want to do differently? Not to say that they're responsible for the violence or that they're um, instigating violence, but that how might they want to plan their life? For a lot of survivors, they might be, if, if someone was thinking about leaving a relationship right now, if you're doing the calculation in your head, you might say, maybe leaving during a pandemic isn't the smartest thing. There's a lot of other stuff going on, so maybe I just need to huddle down right now and not make this decision to leave. So we've got some tools for that. Um, there are tools called safety planning applications. And there's one that's available on all of the app stores. It's called My Plan. And it's an app that people can get. It's secure, it's confidential. Um, and people can get it and it will sort of guide folks through some thinking and some planning so how they can make their own informed decisions for when it may be right for them to leave a relationship if that's what they decide to do. Okay, and and that that sounds fascinating, and I'll definitely leave a link uh, for that uh, in the in the show notes. I feel very fancy saying that, even though this isn't really a podcast. Um, but but YouTube allows for like a fairly long description afterwards, so I'll put all this information in there. And then in terms of you being able to to are you, are you going to have to wait until after COVID? Other than people who are hospitalized, you don't have to tell me the specific techniques. But how do you gather? There's two things. There's getting the information to the people who are in trouble, and then there's getting information back out to researchers to be able to plan. Are you able to gather information from these apps, or, or how, how are there ways to infiltrate that you don't need to share with me, but do you have ways to get this data, or is it kind of a little bit on lockdown right now? Well, so I think that there are data that are coming and they're coming to different sources. These are data that would be routine, co routinely collected. So things like police reports, right? Sure. Um, so how often are police being called? And these are things that researchers can look at, right? You could compare how often were police called last year for domestic violence or intimate partner violence reports as opposed to during the COVID period. Um, you can also look at things like call center data, right? So we have the National Domestic Violence Hotline. We also have a hotline here in Georgia. And, and we also have information from shelters, right? So we can look at data in real time and be able to make comparative analyses or comparisons between what has happened historically, what's happened in the past, and what's happening now. Now, some of those data can be sort of conflicting, right? Because I said earlier when we were talking about how, you know, reported violence is going up or people saying that violence is going up. Sometimes you look at these data and you see shelter data and call center data, and those numbers are going way down. And what the role of researchers is really to get in and to interpret what those data mean. Like, what are the reasons for that? And that's why, of course, it's important to not just look at the numbers, which is something that a lot of researchers and statisticians and epidemiologists like to do. And I'm so happy that everybody knows what an epidemiologist is now. That's one 
<laughs> silver lining of COVID. Um, but also we need qualitative research, right? That is, we need to talk to people about their experiences. And that can be really, really challenging during this time period because people are managing um, so much, but there are ways um, and there are certainly communities and projects that are ongoing providing support to survivors. And so they're able to have their finger on that pulse a little bit better. So something you said struck me, um, one out of three women, first off, I mean, the, the, the evidence, the, the anecdotal evidence, 50% increase in China, 36% increase in France. That's insanely scary um, and horrifying. Um, and that you said one out of three women experience, uh, you said, I think, physical, emotional, or the, uh, there was a third one, I forget. How do you define emotional abuse in your, um, in your area of expertise? And, and how would someone know that they've been or are being emotionally abused? Because uh, that, that almost might be the hardest to recognize on some level. Absolutely. So, so the three, um, as researchers, we tend to like to put these things in these nice little buckets. Um, and so we talk about physical violence, sexual violence, and psychological violence. Um, and, but one of the things is when we say sort of violence, right, that's sort of an amorphous term. It's a little bit amorphous. So when we really drill down to doing the research, we need to be very specific. What do we mean about physical violence? We can talk about slapping, pushing, kicking, punching, right? Very specific actions that a person might take that we can define as physical violence. Um, we would do similar things for sexual violence, right? We could talk about penetration and, and different things like that. Um, with psychological violence, you're right, this is trickier, right? So emotional um, violence are some things that we can consider. We can also think about financial um, coercion or financial violence, right? Manipulation, one partner controlling the finances in the, in the home, not allowing the other person to either work, to have their own money or to be able to control their own money. Um, but really the thing that I would focus on for psychological abuse are what we would call controlling behaviors. And so these controlling behaviors include um, isolation. And that's what's so scary about COVID hmm. because COVID, this idea of social distancing or social isolation is actually exactly the kind of tactic that perpetrators of violence may use as psychological abuse or as psychological control. So that's one of the reasons why a lot of people are hypothesizing about this kind of connection, right? That isolation and control are things that perpetrators use. But the other things that I would point to in terms of perpetration and why the COVID period may be so important is to think about the kinds of stress that people are under. So what we know about violence perpetration is that there are a couple of things that can be risk factors. Unemployment is a risk factor. Unemployment claims in Georgia have gone up by like 400% in the last month. Yeah. So we have a lot of people that are experiencing unemployment or a lot of financial stress right now. And that in and of itself is a risk factor for violence perpetration, right? Um, depression. And, you know, and other psychological conditions. Right now, a lot of people may be feeling depressed, they may be feeling hopeless, they may be feeling anxious. There's a lot of uncertainty in our world. And that also is a risk factor for violence perpetration. Um, so, and then of course, these isolating and controlling behaviors, which are another thing that perpetrators, people that commit violence, may do as a, as a way to try and control what's happening in their relationship. So those things often take the forms of extreme jealousy, wanting to isolate partners from their friends or family. Um, and then we can also think about verbal abuse, right? Because psychological abuse also includes verbal abuse. So thinking about demeaning language, name calling, um, those kinds of things. These are not um, healthy, healthy behaviors within a relationship. And so um, sometimes what we might want to think about is think about, would we want our daughter to experience that? Would we want our sister to experience that? Sometimes when people are in a relationship themselves, they just become accustomed to what's normal within the relationship, yeah. and they may not recognize it as violence. And we know that within relationships, violence will typically increase in terms of its um, severity. So it might start with things like yelling and berating and name calling and then escalate to physical violence. 
Um, and so we want to think about, you know, if somebody did that to my sister, if somebody did that to my mother or my daughter, would that be okay? Mm -hmm. And if the answer to that is no, that's a pretty good indicator. Yeah, that's really uh, a, a great explanation. Thank you. So what can people do from their homes? Um, you already mentioned some things. If, if anyone watching this feels like they are being, um, you know, abused or, um, or, or someone they know, they can share the resources, the My Plan app. Um, so I guess, what are some other resources for people who are being abused? But then what can people who are not, who want to help in some way, but we're all stuck in our houses, even though our governor is telling us it's okay to leave, hopefully lots of people are not leaving. Um, what can we do to help? How can we activate ourselves to make a difference? Absolutely. So I think that um, for individuals or for people that are friends or family um, of individuals that they think may be in a violent relationship, I would definitely recommend the My Plan app mm -hmm. as well as the Danger Assessment. You can also find that online and I'll be happy to share the link with you for that. Okay. Um, so those are those tools that are really going to help you figure out, um, you know, a little bit about the risk that a person may be in and also the tools that may help them to be able to plan to leave a relationship if they want to. If individuals are actually acutely experiencing violence, I would encourage them to call the police, right? The police are essential workers and they are still responding to domestic violence calls. So if um, violence is happening, I would encourage people to still continue to call. Um, one of the dangers is that courts are not open right now. So one of the things that individuals can advocate for is to ask the governor or other politicians, whoever they may be appealing to, to really try and think of some innovative ways for providing protection, things like restraining orders, mm -hmm. um, for people that may um, call the police or need those kinds of protection. And then more broadly, um, support domestic violence agencies. So um, there, there's a Georgia Domestic Violence Task Force that I'll be willing to share with Jill um, their information. So if people are able to financially um, support them, that's always appreciated. And then just more broadly, you know, with political engagement, I would think about both at the state level and the federal level, as I mentioned previously, you know, knowing what we know about how prevalent violence is within our society, we know enough um, to know that we need to be planning and thinking about this in our COVID um, response efforts. So encouraging people to call their representatives and the governor's office, as well as their federal representatives, um, to include consideration, you know, some line item support for violence programs during this period of time. That's really helpful. How do you feel like this uh, domestic violence uh, in particular has, does, are there certain uh, populations that are at higher risk right now? A lot of the, the interviews I've been doing have been on healthcare disparities <clears throat> and minority population. Um, how does that, or does that uh, change how domestic violence plays out during COVID, do you think? So, you know, domestic violence happens across racial groups. Of, of course, race is, is a social construct, um, but racism is very real. And, um, and domestic violence happens at all sort of income levels, at all, at all socioeconomic statuses, at all races. Um, and that, that is true. There is nothing specific to a particular group that makes them inherently more uh, likely to either perpetrate or experience violence. Having said that, what I would mention is that um, socioeconomic status, and as I mentioned, financial stresses and unemployment can be a really big precursor or antecedent to, um, to violence perpetration um, and having that sort of instability in the household. So what that means is that people who have lower income are disproportionately affected by violence in their relationships. And so, uh, so the people that are precisely the kinds of people that are having to work in low pay jobs, um, who are disproportionately African American and other um, racial groups may experience violence more often. But again, I wanna underscore that, that doesn't, that's not because of who they are. It has more to do with the socio-contextual determinants um, that sort of put them in positions of disadvantage. Um, I like, so social, I've been wondering, so like healthcare disparities or the social determinants of health. So it sounds like social, socio-contextual determinants. Is that the non-healthcare term? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Like 
Um, thank you. I've been needing language for that um, as I've been writing about this more and, and interviewing more people about this. Um, awesome. Also, do we, do we have a little bit of time to talk about reproductive justice? Do you want to? Yeah, absolutely. Let's do it. Um, so, so, you know, my, my exposure to it is, is uh, seeing that, you know, and in, in, I think in Texas and a few other states, they're saying, oh, that's like a non-essential, a non-essential procedure. Therefore, sorry, can't have it. Um, and, and that's my first inkling because I don't, I don't do this work professionally and I'm not as good about anticipating the way things are going to play out um, in, in these kinds of things. So that's, that's what first piqued my attention to it. Um, you, you work in this arena a lot professionally and I think on a more like a volunteer basis as well. Can you talk a little bit about, um, a little bit about the baseline of reproductive justice issues in this country um, and, and what's been happening now with COVID? Yeah, so maybe just trying to bridge the two co topics, I would say that the bridge that I see has to do with control, right? So in the context of gender-based violence and, um, and intimate partner violence in particular, you know, we talked about controlling behaviors of individual partners wanting to control um, their partners. And there's something called reproductive coercion, which is something that happens within intimate partner relationships. And that would look like things like not allowing your partner to use contraception or wanting to control um, their contraceptive choices. You know, you can imagine that if you have a child that that creates a responsibility, it creates a bond within a relationship potentially. So reproductive coercion is something that enters into the intimate partner space. Mm -hmm. um, but we can also think about reproductive coercion in another way, and that is more at the level of the state. So that is um, the way in which the state or government may intervene in individual people's decisions over what they choose to do with their bodies, um, whether that is taking birth control or not taking birth control, having an abortion or not having an abortion, whatever that may look like. So um, yes, I think that there are lots of people that are taking advantage of this COVID, of the COVID pandemic for um, opportunities, right? They're looking for opportunities to advance agendas that, um, that they've had for many, many years. Um, so I am not a reproductive justice expert, but we do live in Atlanta, which is, you know, a very strong um, place for reproductive justice. And what I can say about it is that reproductive justice is really focused on bringing together um, reproductive health, reproductive rights and justice. And what that means is particularly centering women of color and black women in particular who are disproportionately affected by many of these issues on the basis of white supremacy and also misogyny. Um, so here in Atlanta, you know, we, we faced a really interesting struggle last year when there was some early abortion ban legislation, sometimes called fetal heartbeat ban. I put the heartbeat in quotes because there's, there's not a functioning human heart um, at the stage of pregnancy that this legislation would affect. And basically that legislation was what some people called a, an early abortion ban or a six week ban, um, which was prohibiting an abortion procedure um, after the detection of fetal, fetal cardiac activity, which usually happens around six weeks um, gestation. And so that's a battle that has been playing out in Georgia for the last year. Um, that bill, although it passed the Georgia legislature and was signed into law by Governor Kemp last year, there is a temporary injunction against that bill so that, or the law, the law is not in effect. And a leading reproductive justice coalition, which is based here in Atlanta, Sister Song, is actually the lead plaintiff, um, along with some other um, abortion clinics and providers here in Atlanta. So they're really leading the charge in that battle. But that is just the latest battle um, in terms of reproductive justice and reproductive rights here in Georgia. And I will say that um, here in Georgia, we haven't had it, as, had it as bad as in some other states. So there have been several other states who have really seized the COVID moment as an opportunity to try and put bans in a place, as you said, like by trying to say that abortion care is not essential health care. I think it doesn't take uh, much to realize that, number one, people still have sex. 
Um, and that means that people can still get pregnant. And it may actually be harder for people to get access to their regular birth control methods. So again, we need research to, to tell us what's going to happen with um, contraceptive use and pregnancies during this time period. But pregnancies don't stop. And the need for people to terminate pregnancies, whether because of, um, for whatever reason, right, whether it's a medical necessity or whether it's any other reason, that those reasons don't stop just because we have a pandemic. Um, abortion is one of the safest medical procedures that we have. 90%, over 90% of abortions that happen in the US happen in the first trimester. And um, pregnancy has higher risk factors than abortion does in this country. So suggesting that abortion care is not essential health care is really, um, you know, it's really a, a false narrative that we need to deconstruct. That's so important. Um, and and uh, <laughs> like deferring it when it's when it's still earlier and safer and then like making people wait and then potentially doing it later if it's riskier and or more emotionally difficult for people um that's for women you know and and that there's just so many so much about it is is fraught um with inconsistency it's fundamentally about control because essentially what the state is saying is that you as an individual aren't uh, you know we don't trust you enough to make decisions about what's best for your body and your life right right exactly um so so yeah so this is all all evolving in real time um although it's all been going on beforehand um and on some levels i, th I think it's one of the one of the secret blessings of covid is that it's bringing to light a lot of issues that have already been there um and for people to understand now more um what's already been going on uh and and ways we can help not just during COVID, but, but moving forward. You mentioned the word white supremacy. And so I know with the work that I've done on my own self and my own education about anti-racism, I know what you mean by that. Can you specify? Because to a lot of people, white supremacy sounds like people wearing hoods um, and you know marching in, in Virginia uh, for, for uh, you know, in KKK rally. So can you, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, the first thing I would say is there are a lot of people that can speak a lot. This is not my area of expertise. Sure, this is sure. my personal experience that I'm sharing. So I'm sort of taking off my professional hat here. And I'm happy to suggest some speakers to come and talk particularly about reproductive justice and um, the way in which that that intertwines. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, my thinking about white supremacy has a lot to do with privilege. Um, so one of the analogies that I've heard is, you know, that being white is like being a fish in water, right? So you don't think about the water. You just breathe the water. You just, that's, it is what it is. Um, so I can use my own family as an example here. Um, my father is one of 13 children who grew up in a rural community in Louisiana. Our, his family was very poor at the time. Um, they had a dairy farm and they grew up poor. Um, but what I can say about my family now is that all of my dad's brothers and sisters went to college. All of them have a college degree and several of them have more advanced degrees and they're very successful financially, right? They have achieved success in their lives. And it's not to say that, that, that some of that success wasn't based on their own hard work, because it was, right? They all worked hard. But I can also say that I look, if I look by comparison, there were also poor black kids that were just as poor or poorer than my dad. And the difference between them was that my family was white and those kids were black. And that was in rural Louisiana. So you can imagine the small and sometimes not small things that help people to advance through their lives. And particularly if you have a system, and that's what I'm talking about when I talk about white supremacy, is a system mm -hmm. that is designed to help some people advance, and those are white people, and to not only not help other people advance, but actually designed to um, oppress the advancement of those people. So that's what I mean when I talk about white supremacy. And part of what I think my perspective on that is to really always try and think about my positionality and, um, 
and how I sit relative to other people, the advantages that I receive simply because of the color of my skin. Um, so that's, those are some of the things that I think about when I think about white supremacy. I think in the terms of thinking about reproductive health rights and justice, you know, we have that white supremacy system um, and I would say sort of a capitalist system, which is really designed to have workers in the masses, right? And who do we want those workers to be, right? We want, it, you know, sort of thinking about the age of industrialization, we want bodies. We want bodies of people that can do things, physical things, physical labor for us. And we know about the ways, hopefully, we know about the ways in which um, enslaved people's bodies have been treated in this country in the past. And the entire system of white supremacy is, is perpetuating that system. So if you weren't enslaved, like once you're in air quotes free, you still are in this capitalist industrialist system, which is designed to oppress your advancement and um, take advantage of your bodies. So when we talk about black and brown people's bodies, um, you know, we can think about that in lots of different contexts, but in the context of reproductive health, we can think about many, many ways in which um, black women's bodies in particularly were um, abused during in, being enslaved um, through sexual violence, but also, you know, more recently thinking about things like um, sterilization efforts without consent mm. um, and promoting certain kinds of um, narratives and behaviors, the exoticization of black women. There are lots of narratives that can sometimes be seemingly conflicted, but they're all sort of rooted in these systems. It's so scary to think about, you know, being white, you don't realize it. You're just like, this is just what society is. But when you're not white, you very acutely from, from what I've read and learned and talked to people, because obviously I haven't experienced our society as a non-white person, you're very aware that it's very, very different for people who, who have the white privilege. And, and this white supremacy is, it permeates everything. And it's not, it's, it's insidious in a lot of ways and it's very blatant in a lot of ways, but, but we're all products of that culture just by living and just yeah. by being born. And, and even these interviews that I've been doing, I mean, it like, it almost shocks me the access that I've gotten to people like just by being a white doctor. I don't think anyone really cares about the fact that I'm a meditation teacher now, but like, I'm a white doctor. I want to talk about race. Sure. Like, like crazy. You know, I just started with other doctors that, you know, that I know, and it's sort of gone out and, and, and even having you, someone at your power, you're my friend, you know, we met when I was in med school. And so I don't know how many other people would know to, to, to have access to you by just being like, Hey, you want to be on my interview? And so even this interview series is, is very much privilege and I'm, I'm doing what I can to use my privilege for good and in bringing information to people um, as you know, you do all the time. I mean, your whole, your whole professional and, and, and beyond life is, is dedicated to that and just so admirable. So, so it's just so interesting how, how it plays out um, and, and becoming the more aware of it you become, the more aware of it you become. And on some levels it can be really painful, I think for white people to be like, Whoa, but it's so important. And it, it it, it doesn't have to all be about discomfort and, and um, avoidance. There's so much you can learn and grow from and, and good that you can do from being aware of that system. So um, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. It's, it's uh, right at two o'clock, so I know you have lots of calls. Um, so thank you so much. Um, how can people find you and work with you and, and learn from you? I, I know you have a like, you're a professor, so you're not like an entrepreneur, but how can people <laughs> follow you and, and learn from you? Yeah, so I'm on Twitter. I welcome people to uh, follow me on Twitter at Dabney Evans. And, you know, if you want me to come on your YouTube show, you can slide into my DMs. Um, I'm accessible. And um, yeah, I just want to give you a round of um, applause or kudos for, for hosting this, um, this conversation. This is a fun conversation to have with a friend, but I know that you're doing other good work. That's really important. And I hope that you get lots of views. Thanks, lady. Thank you so much for joining. And this is Dr. Dabney Evans, who is, you know, officially the smartest person I know and um, uh, wonderful in so many other ways uh, than just that. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks.